Defining detailing. <laughs> Defining detailing. Hi, I'm Ivan. I'm Nick. And this is the DIY Detail Podcast. Today, we're going to start a series where we define terms that are prevalent in the detailing world, but someone new to detailing may not know what they mean. This is sort of simple and profound. It's that nice mix of basics, but also when you realize people ask questions about them all the time, Ivan, it's not so basic. So let's just get right into it because we're going to have a series of these videos from time to time. As we get the questions, I write the words down and say, oh, let's do that one. So the first one is what is a polish or what is polish? Right. So polish, depending on where you're coming from, can mean very different things. So different countries and different ages and different times as well. For us, a polish is an abrasive. It is something that you use to polish away those scratches, those paint. So it's like a a liquid sandpaper in effect. But a lot of people have the idea of polish like a shoe polish. It's something that you apply. And we get the question often, can I apply your polish by hand? And when we get that question, we know that the person is asking, hey, this is like a wax, I can put it on. No, it isn't a wax. Our polish, the gold standard polish is a pure abrasive. It leaves nothing behind. It doesn't leave anything on the surface, meaning it's not a wax, it's not for protection. There's no protection involved. Can you use the gold standard polish by hand? Sure, you can, Uh, but it's gonna be a lot of work. The only time I like to use it by hand is maybe on a rag if I'm doing my side mirrors and there's some water spots on there. Yeah, or you know, inside the door handle, things like that. Yeah, otherwise put it on a polisher, it's gonna do the work for you, it's meant to do that. There's so much to talk about. One other one I want to ask, because these are some of the, the, the top questions we ask is about clay, right? Clay right. bar, clay towel. We want to define these terms. The word clay is a little bit of a misnomer because there's actually no clay in any clay bars or any clay towels or clay media, however you want to look at it. But it comes from the, the original clay bars look like you're molding clay, you know, the you're you're on the potter's wheel and you've got clay there and you're making a bowl and the wheel is spinning. It has about the same feeling and effect like that. In the beginning, some people called it clay. Some people called it putty because some people actually have tried to use plumber's putty as clay and it works, but not the greatest. Nonetheless. Yeah, it sounds like a recipe for some uh, marred up paint right there. A very good recipe for marred up paint and it's sticky too. But nonetheless, a lot of people have taken the word clay and that's what the industry accepted term is now it doesn't mean that there's clay in it now what does a clay bar do or what does a clay towel do a clay bar is to remove contamination from the vehicle and that's another question what's contamination but we'll get to that one in a second so you're removing contamination from the surface that contamination you're removing is embedded it's from brakes it's from industrial fallout it's from all sorts of things that get stuck to your paint that even with washing you're not getting them out we have our perforated synthetic decontamination towel. Long word to say clay towel, but it better describes what it is. So first of all, it's a synthetic surface that's on a towel that's perforated, perforated synthetic decontamination towel. And what the towel does is using lubrication, like rinse us wash, like iron remover, like ceramic gloss, incredible suds, you're removing the contamination from the surface. That contamination that you're removing from the surface is getting trapped in the towel. When you rinse it in your wash bucket, it gets released. That is what decontamination is, and that's what a clay towel does. Clay bars are literally like a a bar of clay. They're, you know, just a a bar. They're somewhere between 50 and 100 grams in weight, so a couple ounces in weight, and you knead it to soften it, and then you go over your paint with it. And then when the surface gets dirty, you fold it onto itself and knead again and knead again until the surface becomes clean. And then you do another small section. So clay bars, while they're great tools, they're very ineffective or they're very effective, but they're very inefficient, first of all. Secondly, they're actually very expensive. You can buy clay bars cheap, but they don't last. They're good for one, two, maybe five cars at most if you're lucky. Whereas this perforated synthetic decontamination towel, you'll get multiple cars out of it. So claying, even though it's a relatively new- Hundreds of cars, Ivan, with our towel. Oh, definitely, yeah. And claying is relatively new in our industry. Uh, you know, it's maybe 25, 30 years old. So it's still something that even professional detailers, some of them don't know how to use it or why to use it. So 
But if you have a PSD towel, you're good. You're going to decontaminate your paint. And Perforated synthetic decontamination, decontamination towel. towel. Yeah, so the PSD towel. But contamination. So contamination is something that builds up on your vehicle. It comes from your brakes. So when, you're, when you hit the brakes hard, you have hot metallic dust coming off those brakes. Yes, you see a lot of it on your wheels, but it also embeds itself onto your paint. If you're living in an area that has a lot of industry, you get industrial fallout on the top. And that's stuff that's in the air that sticks to your paint. And no matter how well you wash your paint, you're not removing the contamination. Now, there's a couple different ways of feeling contamination because with your naked hand, you really don't feel it too much unless you're really, really badly contaminated. But just general contamination, a couple different ways. One is put your hand in a plastic bag and then feel through the bag, the paint, and you'll feel what feels like little bumps, and that's the contamination. Another way is just take your credit card with no pressure on it, just hold it lightly between your fingers and drag it along the surface. Make sure the surface is clean first, but just move it along the surface and you'll actually hear and feel the contamination. And once you decontaminate it with a towel or a clay bar or what have you, then you'll do that again and it'll be a nice smooth surface. Yeah, and those hot particles that come off the brakes, they're hot, right? And uh, yeah. clear coat is plastic. So those hot particles, they embed themselves into the plastic and remember, those particles are metal, and then they sit on your paint for a while. It's plastic, yep. but it, they sit on your clear coat, and eventually they start to rust. They start to turn orange, and that's why you see those orange spots on the yeah. sides of your white vehicle on the doors, right? So that, that's kind of what's happening there, and we decontaminate with the decon towel and our iron remover to go ahead and remove them. What is right. iron remover, Ivan? People are going to so, ask, what is iron remover? What is it really doing? It's a rust converter, yeah. you say. Right, so iron remover, again... We're new in the industry. We've only been around a year and a half, but the term iron remover it predates DIY detail. That's why we call it iron remover because with SEO, search engine optimization, people searching for DIY detail, rust converter, they would never find it because uh, people search for iron remover. Now, iron remover, again, a bit of a misnomer because it's not actually removing iron. It's removing the rust stain that's caused by the iron particle. So as an example, you have that piece of metal coming off your brakes or the car beside you. And this is one question I got. Yeah, but I drive a Tesla. I don't use the brakes. You're driving on a road. There's other people braking beside you. You're still getting metal contamination on your vehicle. You may not be Absolutely. getting as much, but you're still getting it on there. So even though you're using regen braking all the time, you're still getting brake dust on your vehicle from other vehicles around you. That being said, what's happening is you have a molten or almost molten ball of metal coming off the brakes and it attaches itself to the paint when it attaches itself to the paint because it's hot and paint is plastic or clear coat is plastic it just goes in just a little bit and sits there then your car gets wet through humidity through dew through rain just through atmospheric moisture and when that happens it starts to rust now we put iron remover on the surface and a lot of companies they'll have you take your iron remover and just spray it all over the surface. And it's an amazing thing. It looks great because now you've got your iron remover that goes on there and wherever it finds a little piece of iron, actually it finds a little piece of rust, not iron, but it starts making these streaks. Some companies are red, some are orange, but it makes these streaks. And those streaks are telling you that's where the rust is. The piece of metal may still be there when you're done because it is not a iron remover. It's not an iron dissolver. It's actually a rust converter. So it's converting the rust. So the stain that we see on a white car behind that little iron ball, it's converting that rust into that liquid or that color uh, that we see that's visual for us, but we're actually not removing the iron. We're not removing that molten piece of metal unless it had enough rust around it that the rust is separating it from the paint and allowing it to fall down. That's why we suggest using our perforated synthetic decontamination towel with iron remover as a lubricant. You're going to use a lot less iron remover because you're spraying one spray on the towel, one spray on the car and doing a small section. And now we're physically agitating and removing that iron particle using the iron remover and, or using the perforated synthetic decontamination towel 
And the iron remover now just has to work on the rust stain. So it's doing what it's supposed to do is converting rust. And it's just working on that aspect of it. Does the iron remover work better at a certain stage? Like when it first turns purple on that rust or 10 minutes later, if you've got, is it continuing to work for you? What's happening throughout yeah. the chemical process? As soon I mean, as I it, know how to use the stuff. I just, yeah, yeah. I don't exactly. know. So as soon as it falls on some rust, it starts converting it. And that's where we get those purple or orange streaks and it starts working and it keeps working as long as it's liquid or until it runs out of rust to work on. So, so you could reliquify it with a little mist of water or, or rinseless or how would you? No, you to want to reliquify it with more iron remover. Okay. So you don't want to dilute it down. You don't want to dilute it that much. You can dilute it a little bit, uh, by diluting it, we're using it normally with either incredible suds or rinseless wash in combination. So we have that on the surface to act as to help with the lubrication. The iron remover provides its own lubrication, and we're using the PSD towel to pluck the piece of iron away and just leave the rust there, and the, the rust converter or the iron remover does its job. I'm a little bit torn as to which way to go here on the next one. Okay. Um, there's two terms that I think are really interesting here. Paint correction, which is what you'd probably do after you've decontaminated. So it might be a nice yep. segue. And Good. if we don't do this next one, we'll, we'll tease to it. All purpose cleaner, just two terms that I think ought to be defined, right? To yeah, uh, the exactly. detailing industry. So paint correction, this is a really big subject. We have you know, lots and lots of videos on our channel on polishing or paint correction or paint enhancement. And the term paint correction is an interesting one because yes, we are correcting the surface appearance. So visually we're correcting the paint. Physically we're damaging the paint. And that's a, a hard subject for a lot of detailers to wrap their heads around. Because what we're doing every time we polish paint, so we're taking a machine, we're taking a pad, we're taking the gold standard polish and we're polishing the surface we're making it look so much better. And that's where the term paint correction comes from because we're making the appearance of the paint look much better. We're getting gloss, we're getting depth, we're removing those little swirls and scratches. But when we're removing the swirls and scratches, the way we're removing them is your scratch, let's say it's, you know, I'll, I'll exaggerate here, but your paint is five inches thick and you're removing your little squirrels on the surface are a quarter inch deep. Well, to remove those squirrels, you have to remove a quarter inch of that surface. And that proportionally is about what we're doing. When you're doing that, you're removing paint. So paint correction, if we we're to be really honest about it, it's paint damage, but we're removing visual damage. So we're removing what us as human beings see as, Ooh, that's not nice. That's ugly. Look at all those scratches. Look at all those swirls. And we're replacing it with a nice, evenly abraded surface. And abraded surface, the polish, to our eyes, we're improving the surface. Once again, we're making it look glossy. We're getting rid of those deeper scratches. All we're doing is refining the surface. So it should be called paint refining. But what we're doing is refining the surface with finer and finer abrasives till our eyes don't see it as scratches anymore. But if we were to take a really powerful microscope to the surface of paint, you'd see that it's not flat at all. It's all these little ridges because we're using finer and finer sandpaper. So if you've ever used sandpaper, let's say you start with 80 grit sandpaper on a piece of wood, you're going to see the lines from every grain of sand on that paper. Then you'll step up to 120 grit and the lines even out, then 220, then 400, then 600, then 800. And when you reach 2000 on wood, it basically looks polished. Uh, yep. When we, we use 2000 grit on paint, it looks matte when we're done and then we take our polisher because now the scratches, let's say use 2000 grit sandpaper. Let's use our five inch thick uh, analogy. Once again, now they're only a 16th of an inch deep with the, the 2000 grit. And then you take your polish and you go over and now you're a, thir a 32nd or a 64th deep. So your eyes perceive it as one uniform surface. Every step along the way from sanding to compounding, which maybe we could define that too, right? With yeah. a wool pad versus refining or, or finishing or jeweling yeah. with the with the foam waffle we have leaves its own scratch pattern, doesn't it? It's just what is perceptible to the eye. Right. And so let's 
dove down that little uh, side road here of compound yeah. polishing. Uh, so basically the term compound means you're using an abrasive compound. So for a lot of people, like we said before, polishing to them is the act of applying a wax or something to enhance the gloss of the surface and apply protection. Whereas compounding is anything that's abrasive because the word compound came from, we used to use abrasive compounds and that abrasive compound with the machine or by hand to refine the paint. So our gold standard polish can also be called the gold standard compound if you wish. Yeah. Uh, because that's what it's doing. So it's an abrasive compound that's in a liquid form that we spray. The Ours is very pad dependent and polishing pads vary in lots of different ways. And polishing pads, I think we'll delve into that one a little later. Uh, we'll have polishing pads with us to do that. But basically what you're doing is you're taking that abrasive compound, you're putting it on the pad, and then you're using a machine to spread the compound on the paint and abrading it. Think of the compound as liquid sandpaper, and that's what we're doing. And we're using finer and finer grits of sandpaper with finer and finer pads. The pads all have their own characteristics. And with the gold standard polish, if you take an aggressive pad, and polishing pads, by the way, if you just put water on them, they're still going to polish the surface. They're still going to abrade the surface because they're actually designed to do that. So you don't really need the abrasive compound. It just speeds things up dramatically, and you get a better finish. But with that you have the just a, a pad with a bit of liquid on it it's still going to do something to the surface because every pad has its own level of cut and by cut we mean abrasion meaning how much material it's removing in one pass i'm sort of curious to talk about all-purpose cleaner but i did hear so many terms in there that i also could talk about do we want to do anything else yeah. on the on the polishing or, or paint correction side I think it's going to be its own uh, subject. We've done a, a couple different podcasts on that, and it's something that can be delved into a lot and a lot deeper in our polishing video. So we have a lot of videos on polishing. We go really in depth. If you watch the whole video, every time someone watches one of our videos, and I've had people that have been detailing for as long as I have say, every time I watch your videos, I learn something. And that's something we try to do. We try to provide education here. And if you like, education and detailing please subscribe hit the notification bell yeah. that's what we're here for yes of course we're selling diy detail products but the whole goal for us is let's provide education if people find value in the education and eh, maybe they'll buy the products that well, being someone said, told me recently let's like, delve into that a little further oh go ahead no i just mean someone told me recently that the feeling of you're making progress is a is a really good feeling as a human so if we have people continue yes. to subscribe, it inspires us to continue to grow and learn and provide awesome content to keep upping our game. You know, it's, we all want to be making progress. So you get it why we asked you to subscribe. But we, we took, you know, about 20 minutes to exactly. do it. So we're not begging for it. We just appreciate you guys out there. All-purpose cleaner, so, Ivan. All-purpose cleaner. Yeah. Yeah. So APC is what people hear a lot of. What's an APC? Well, APC is an acronym for all-purpose cleaner. And all-purpose cleaner there's a lot of different things on the market that are called all purpose cleaner. And some of them we shouldn't be using in detailing. Those are degreasers. There are some really harsh degreasers on the market that people have adopted because they're inexpensive as all purpose cleaners. And they're running a big risk every time they do that. So uh, you can buy it at the dollar store. You can buy it at the, you know, the Walmart, things like that. They're degreasers. Look on the bottle for the, actual term all-purpose cleaner. And in the detailing realm, we have all clean. There are other companies that make good all-purpose cleaners as well. And when it's an all-purpose cleaner, it's not called a degreaser. The two use a very different chemical makeup to get roughly to the same point. But a degreaser, especially on interior, so for plastic, things like that, you can actually damage interior plastics. You can damage vinyl. You can damage leather with a degreaser. Whereas an all-purpose cleaner, the chemical makeup of it is much safer. Now, what makes it all purpose? Why do we call it an all purpose cleaner? Depending on how you dilute it, it can be used for multiple things. So our, we'll use all clean as our example because hey, that's the one we sell. Uh, but all clean is an extremely powerful all purpose cleaner. Normally you'll start at a 15 to one dilution and 15 to one dilution means 15 parts water, one part solution, one part of the, the all purpose cleaner. 
Someone asked me about that. So it's not 14 parts and one part to make up 15. So you'd have a, yeah. a 16 ounce total when you do 15 right. to one. Right. Or in a gallon, you use eight ounces of all clean and 120 gallons of water. That again is your 15 to one dilution. Now we'll use a 15 to one dilution to clean wheels, to clean tires, to clean engine bays, door jams, grease, things like that. On the interior, 15 to one is way too powerful. Yeah. 30 to one or even 60 to one is a, a good ratio for interiors. So the same product that you're using, you can use it to degrease your engine as well as you can use it to clean your steering wheel. Now, do we condone the use of all clean on the interior? Of course, but use the mildest chemical you can first. Start with a rinseless washer, interior clean and protect to do your interiors before going to the all clean. All clean is like the sledgehammer on interiors. If you can drive that finishing nail with a little finishing hammer, great, that's all you need. You don't need to get a sledgehammer to drive a finishing nail, and that's what all-purpose cleaner is. So APC, like all clean, is a very strong chemical. Use in um, moderation. Yeah, I think it's a really easy thing to do on interiors is to use a cleaner that is too strong for what you actually need. Rinse right. wash is a phenomenal cleaner for interiors. So I like to yeah. say... If you're doing a rinseless wash, do the outside of the vehicle first, right? And then use yeah. that same rinseless wash bucket. I know it seems scary. Doesn't it have stuff in there? What's going to happen? Yeah. Trust me, it's fine. Unless unless your rinseless wash bucket, Ivan, is like black. Yeah. You know, and you've like you've used it on wheels and you've dunked, redunked. Then I'm probably not taking on the interior. But common yeah. sense after one wash, we've emulsified a lot of what's in, you know, on that car, it's held in suspension. The rinseless wash still works on interiors. And then if you used incredible suds, yeah. then use interior clean and protect to clean the interior. But if you have your rinseless wash bucket, save a little bit of money. It's super efficient. Wring that towel out. I like a short nap towel. Wring it out. And then I like yeah. to have a dry towel as well for my dry pass. So I wipe with the rinseless wash damp towel, dry pass, and I'm good to go. Exactly. No, so like we said, all purpose cleaner, use it for what it's designed for. Now, some people have asked us, why don't you guys have a wheel cleaner? Why don't you have a tire cleaner? We have them. They're called all clean. Uh, you know, wheel cleaners, tire cleaners are just derivatives of all purpose cleaners. They're just uh, another label on a bottle. That's basically what it is. Just use our all clean for your wheels, for your tires, for your engine bay, your door jams. And if you need to in the interior, then use it there. Hey, and if you're listening to this right now, and it will not be in the future, but as we put this podcast out on Friday, we have a buy two gallons, get one free sale going on. So maybe you wanted to get that gallon of all clean. You yeah. could get it as part of this package. I am warning you, though, after this week, this special sale won't be won't be good. But if you're listening, you made it this far, maybe it's time to get that gallon of all clean that you've been thinking about for a long time. Yeah, well, you're, you're listening to this on Friday and the sale ends Saturday. So... It's time. Go, go to DIYDetail.com right now. Uh, it's a special sale. Um, yeah. I, I wanted to end this at about 30 minutes, so I think we have time for another subject. Yeah. And it's a big one. So maybe we just end here, but what the heck is a ceramic coating? Okay, so ceramic coating is protection. And let's go back in time a little bit. People wax their cars. People simonize their cars, which was another way of saying waxing. It was just a very popular brand. And waxing is protection. Waxing adds maybe two, three months worth of protection. Then come sealants. And sealants are basically a wax, but a synthetic wax. So synthetic sealants, they became, started becoming popular in the late 60s, early 70s. They add more longevity, a little more gloss than a wax, but they don't fill. A wax fills. So wax has a superpower and that superpower is filling. So if you have those little micro swirls, it's going to fill those swirls, but it's going to go away in time. Temporary, wax. visual. Yeah. It's a beautiful thing, but it's not permanent. No, exactly. Now, fast forward to the late 90s, ceramic coatings start coming on the market. Now, ceramic coatings, the word coating is used universally as just about anything. Uh, paint is a coating. You're putting peanut butter on your slice of toast. You're coating your toast with peanut butter. Coating is just one liquid or one surface on top of another. You're coating the surface. 
ceramic coatings, they contain ceramic resins in them. They contain ceramic particles. And a lot of people, one of the questions we get asked about a ceramic coating is, oh, what's your percentage of ceramic? Well, it's a lot more complicated than just saying a percentage of ceramic because a lot of the ceramics and ceramic coating are actually formed by chemical reaction. So it's not like we're going outside, taking grandma's china, breaking it, mashing it down into small, small particles, putting it in a liquid, spreading it on the car and saying, hey, we have a ceramic coating. It's completely different than that. Uh, in our case, you know, our coatings contain polysilazane, which is a pre-ceramic. We have silicon carbide, silicon nitride, and silicon dioxide. The silicon carbide, there's actually no silicon carbide in the formula. The coating, when we put it on the vehicle, starts a chain reaction, a chemical reaction, and silicon carbide is formed from that reaction. So by saying we have X percentage of ceramic in the vial isn't really a good thing. But anyways, I digress there just a little bit. Ceramic coating is the best protection you can put on your vehicle for your paint. Now, there is paint protection film, which is a film that goes over top of your paint that's really thick, maybe 8 or 10 uh, mils thick. But a ceramic coating, a lot of people that install PPF still put a ceramic coating over top of the paint protection film because it does things that a paint protection film can't do. And a paint protection film does things that a ceramic coating can't do. Paint protection film, great against scratching, great against rock chips, yep. uh, road rash, things like that. Ceramic coating is not protecting against scratching. It's not protecting against rock chips. It's not protecting against road rash. But ceramic coating, what it does for you, A, gives you gloss and slickness. We really like that. Most, more importantly, it makes your vehicle much, much easier to clean, much easier to maintain. And when you have a vehicle that's easier to maintain, you're going to wash it less often, which means the less often you wash it, the less chance you have of creating damage on your paint. Uh, the other thing the ceramic coating does, one of its superpowers is chemical resistance. So you can put a wax on a vehicle and you put that wax on, you wash it once with APC, you probably don't have any wax left. Whereas our ceramic coatings, if you wanted to wash it every day with APC, technically you could. And yeah. it, wouldn't, it wouldn't damage the coating in any way. Uh, so that is the one big superpower. And why is that important when you say, well, I'm never going to wash my car with APC. I don't need that. There's these things called insects and birds. Let's talk about the birds and the bees. No, no, don't worry. We're not going there. Uh, but no. yeah, yeah, exactly. But nonetheless, a bird flies over your car, decides it's time to go to the bathroom, and your car is the happy recipient. Well, if you have an unprotected paint and you leave that bake in the sun, you're going to get what's called etching. So you're going to remove the remnants of the bird dropping and you're still going to see like a little halo there or where it was. That's because of etching and the acids and the, you know, whatever is in that little bird dropping actually eats into your paint. So that's why chemical protection or chemical resistance is important it's not going to eat into the coating. Same thing with bugs. You're driving down the highway, you get bugs on the front. And if you live in the Southeast, you have these things called love bugs. Love bugs are notorious for eating through paint. Uh, and when you go through a cloud of love bugs, your front is just plastered with them. You need to get those off as soon as possible. If you have a ceramic coating, it's going to get, getting them off is going to be much easier, but also less of an urgent task absolutely oh is, are we done yeah. now i feel like you're just getting started ivan well again this is a the beginning of a series yes. defining detailing where we're going to dive deeper and deeper and you'll notice under my name what's your question well that's what we're here for we want to answer your questions we want to educate we want to help so if you have a question leave it in the comments below and in the next defining detailing we might be uh, shouting you out and saying this is a question from you. Oh, I like that a lot. You know what people also might like, since we're talking about ceramic coatings, a yeah. recent video we did where it was start to finish. Unedited, yeah. Ivan polishes and coats an entire vehicle live on YouTube. I'm going to put a link to it. It's a live stream. You don't want to miss it. Other direction. Uh, there you go. Right in the uh, center. Uh, Perfect. My, there we go. That way. There. We'll see you there.